So hello everyone, happy Saturday today. Welcome back to our online conversation series. Again, I'm Bailey Mizell, the Director of the Photographic Arts Council of Los Angeles. I'm personally excited to be joined today by multidisciplinary artist and educator, Jeffrey Stuker for an artist lecture. Thank you for joining us today, Jeffrey. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Bailey. Absolutely. Um, and for those of you joining us for the first time today, Path LA is a nonprofit organization that fosters the education, scholarship, and advocacy of the photographic and image-based arts. We're made up of our membership and board of directors who are collectors, photographers, students, educators, and curators. To learn more about Path LA and to visit some content shared by Jeffrey, visit the links in the chat that we just provided. Uh, before we get started, I'd also like to send a note of gratitude to our board of directors, membership, community partners, and sponsors. Thank you for your ongoing support and commitment to PACLA's growth, our programming, and building our community, especially as we celebrate 10 years this year. We look forward to sharing more with you throughout the remainder of the year. I'm going to just give you a quick run of show for today's event, and then we'll hop into introducing Jeffrey, and then we'll get right into his presentation. So there'll be a 40 to 45 minute presentation with Jeffrey, followed by an open Q&A and conversation. During the presentation, at any point, please add your questions and comments in the chat in the Q&A box, and then we'll hop to that towards the end uh, with our Q&A session. Now to introduce Jeffrey. Jeffrey Stuker was born in Colorado in 1979. He received a BFA from the School of the Museum of Fine Arts at Tufts University, and an MFA from the Yale University, where he also taught from 2006 to 2013. Stuker is currently a co-editor of the journal Effects and a lecturer at the University of California, San Diego. Jeffrey has recently exhibited at Larder, No Moon LA, slash the Fulcrum Press, Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the International Biennial of Contemporary Photography at MoMAS, and the Hammer Museum. His writing has been published in Moose, The White Review, Art Handler, among others. And without further ado, I'd like to pass it to you, Jeffrey, to get started uh, today. I will be back on camera to moderate our Q&A towards the end of today's presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Bailey. It's really an honor to be here and to, um, to speak with you and um, to speak with everyone here who's joined us. And um, well, I'll just take a, a short minute uh, to thank a few people. I wanted to focus this slide presentation um, or this artist talk on on projects that are that are largely local and based here in Los Angeles, which has been my home for well nearly ten years now, and um, it's been a totally transformative time. And um, so I I met you Bailey through Peter Tomka, and and so thanks to Peter for setting this up and 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 making this introduction and Peter's a good person to start with because he runs No Moon No Lay where, where I recently had a solo exhibition and it was a very moving experience for me so I thank Peter and Marty um from No Moon and um I'd like to thank Josh Shadle um I'm um I'm also going to be showing uh works from a couple different smaller local galleries so I'd also like to thank people involved with that over the last 10 years. And that includes um, Becca Lieb and David Munzer from Full House. Uh, I'll start with some slides from there. It's um, to thank Britta and Zach from Garden, where I, I first showed the film that I'm going to show some clips of here, uh, Mimicry and the Monte Carlo, Carlo Predator. And uh, I'd also like to, to thank Tabitha Steinberg, with whom I worked at Larder for, for a number of the works that are um, in this presentation. And I mean, the list will go on, but but also uh, Tabitha and Ace are, are two people uh, with whom uh, I've, I've put together this, uh, my work in this show uh, of theirs called Atavism for the Future, which is currently on view and linked in the chat. So uh, there's at least, half a dozen more people to name in that list and maybe I'll come back to them. But I, I wanna start by uh, this invocation of those names because that's been essential to me being in LA, having these, these close friendships and working relationships, these intellectual friendships as I have with, uh, for instance, Jan Tumler and my friend Nicholas Miller. Um, this wouldn't, I, I just wouldn't have been able to sustain myself without these relationships. So, so I want to mark that down. It's very important to me. 
Um, okay, so sp- speaking of that, or- organically, it comes from there. Looking back ar- around, I'd say, 10 years, um, and uh, I I came to L.A. from Connecticut and, and New York, um, where I've been teaching for a long time, as, as Bailey said, um, and I came to L.A. to do a show, and that was with David Munzer and Becca Lieb in a space that they ran, which is currently on pause or or at least no longer in its original location called Full House. And that was a very generative um, working uh, relationship, a very generative project for me working with them on that. It brought me to L.A. for a sustained amount of time, and it was you know, it was very exciting to me. Um, gave me a chance to show something that was was very different. Um, and so I'm going to start with some uh, some work that uh, we put together in a collective format at MoCA, and that was um, part of the MoCA storefront space. So I'm going to go ahead and put the share screen. Okay, and um, so these are um, an external, this is an external shot of the storefront project at Full House and um, a collection of artists and an installation which was called the Sealed Library. Here the Sealed Library plays on the idea of enclosure being um, debarred from the interior of the space. This is from 2017, 2018, as I remember it. And um, well, there's a couple of things that are happening here that that it seems, um, well, there's still a real interest to me. And, and so it seems like a good place to start this talk. Um, one is um, an interest in and a, and a returning to the archive not as a place of neutral historical truth or of mere factuality, but as a place of of narrative, not exactly fiction in the sense of um, imaginary doings of of characters, but more in the sense of the place where meaning could still be constructed, arrested, suspended. Uh, So then call it the fictional element in this project or in the sealed library uh, in general, is that um, this storefront was was represented or reconstructed to appear as the storage facility that it always already was for a short period, and under the um, di- under the direction originally of Lauren Mackler, the storefront became an exhibition space that was closed off from the public and um, was simply uh, available to be seen through these windows in the courtyard of the Museum of Contemporary Art Los Angeles. It seemed interesting to return it to its state as a storehouse, but continue to keep it lit and, and have the windows open. Here, everything that's on display is, um, well, a kind of um, historical collage of sorts, a, a number of constructed and found and, and reconfigured artifacts um, from, from different artists. And these include Clementine Keith Roach, the sculptor, Christopher Page, the painter, Nicholas G. Miller, the sculptor, Lakshmi Luthra, the photographer, uh, Chris Carlton, a poet and writer in general, and Steve Cato. Who, here, um, the the larger overarching theme that was to be archived or presented at least as a fictional archive were projects that gathered around the concept of second nature. And second nature as it appears in a critical philosophical genealogy from the end of the 19th century to the present. And roughly second nature tends to mean or tends to describe phenomena that are used to narrate historical constructions as if they were natural, oftentimes um, ability, genetics, physiology, the morphology of bodies, body types are used 
um, as the supposedly stable ground upon which social, socially inscribed values play out. One of those examples is um, milk and the breast. And um, in general, we could call it an idea of biological reproduction, which is which purports to be neutral and purports to be always good. In the sculptor Clementine Keith Roach's work, which you can see here, if you can see my marquee, we have a number of um, sculpted and, and cast reconstructions of um, breast replacements, replacement parts for the body uh, where, uh, at least on her body at that time, because she was a new mother, was um, constantly in demand for the production of milk. And the work that she made, the sculptural work, had to do with this levels of surrogates and replacement objects and partial objects that, that ultimately emerge um, from that relationship between the infant and the mother or between, um, well, we could say the, the child or the new human being and its external environment and the objects that come to replace the mother's breast. Uh, I'll pause at this moment and um, maybe Bailey, if, if for some reason the audio is strange when I try to do this, you can let me know, but I have a voice recording um, sure. from the project. So um, you can see here, um, there are speakers that were part of this project at MOCA and they played sound. Um, they played a, a, a recorded voice um, piece um, that we made collectively and uh, um, they played out into the courtyard. So, so I'll play Clementine's now. Well, that's not right. Okay, maybe that's not going to work. Maybe I can just do it by space bar. No? Sorry. I think we heard it for a second there, Jeffrey. Might be my friend Stormzy playing through iTunes because iTunes is trying to play the file. Yeah. All right, let's try. Let's just try. Pure, fresh, and well packaged liquid gold for $1 per ounce. My milk is naturally full of calories and protein. I eat healthily. My diet is 90% organic and all meat, dairy, and eggs are grass-fed and free-range. I'm gluten-free and soy light. I take prenatal vitamins, no alcohol, no drugs, no tobacco. I use all natural body products and cleaning products. No parabens, phthalates, petroleum, perfumes, or fragrances touch my skin. I am a yoga instructor and work out four to five times a week. I have at least 1,000 ounces of fresh breast milk available today and anticipate continued excess. After my milk is pumped, it is put in Kinder Twist System storage bags and immediately placed in an Arctic King deep freezer. All of my milk bags are sealed, dated, and labeled. No adult wet nursing. No pictures. No videos. No checks. And no scams. Payment by PayPal only. I okay, so so this is um, one of of several voices that came on to the overhead speakers and played as a disembodied voice. Um, and this was an authored by Clementine Keith Roach and and connected to these um, these breast surrogates that you can see. I can zoom back in here. 
in this part. And um, the idea was um, to stage a situation in which it seemed as though the modular shelving units of, of an institutional storage system accidentally revealed these different elements. Of course, every element, as you can start to see from the, the plywood and, and whatnot that makes up this shelf was, was constructed. It was an elaborate mise-en-scene and, and staging of, of this supposedly neutral um, format. And uh, our, our interest was, was in precisely um, setting up uh, ways of thinking about the non-neutrality of the archive and of the um, of the still up for debate and still to be constructed meaning of of things as um, such as art storage and and handling and um, in general the recorded history of the contemporary era. In Clementine's voiceover, the thing that or in, in recorded voice work, the thing that excites me is it sets up a way of connecting this archive to what we might call the disciplining of the body. In this case, a, a, an idea of normative biological femininity, which is supposed to have something to do with being a good person or a good mother, being um, capable of producing some kind of pure milk, which here is not seen as anything but um, an instrumentalized, uh, nutrient-rich uh, effluvium for for the the child. Uh, so that's that's exciting to think about. Uh, in 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 the midst of this, I contributed um, work about the Vinca cataranthus plant, which you can see zooming in here on this image, which are presented as uh, herbarium specimens. Uh, collected from uh, around the world, but um, originally collected under the auspices of French colonialism by um, French explorers, and uh, one in particular named Flacour. And this plant um, is totally instrumental in modern medicine. It's under a patent by Eli Lilly, um, and it was the first and still one of the most successful chemotherapeutic agents used in the treatment of cancer and lymphoma, especially for children. I'll return to this subject, but um, this seemed to me a great example of something that, um, like mother's milk, is being presented to us as an always an inherently good thing, which doesn't have a history, is simply um, purely beneficial to humanity. When in fact, um, a long history of colonialism and of um, expropriation by means of violence is how uh, the Occident, for lack of a better word, came into any kind of relationship or any kind of knowledge of this plant and appropriation of um, shamanistic and traditional medicine uh, was the only way that its medicinal properties were revealed to anyone, revealed to the world at all. I'll come back to that, but I wanted to also play one bit of sound again. This is uh, a less algorithmic sounding Clementine reading. Um, a... Vinca rosea. This plant was first taken from Madagascar by Flacor, who, without compunction, described the island's inhabitants in this way. Nowhere in the world has there ever been a nation more prone to treachery, dissimulation, flattery, cruelty, illusion, and trickery than this one here? So you can you can see in the citation from Flacour precisely the the contempt and and the audacious disregard and disrespect for the inhabitants of the island from which this um, plant, which he was the first to take as a clipping um, back to the Royal Medicinal Gardens in Paris. You can see precisely this, um, this disconnect and the, the residue in his own words of a, of a violent expropriation. I'll pause there and on uh, a final image Here, one final way of thinking about the non-neutrality of the archive or the archive itself as a scene of writing rather than a collection 
of existing and settled meanings. Uh, the what should be the informational placard, the the um, cataloging index for what's contained on the shelves are themselves very short poems written in a kind of hyper abbreviation or micro style by the poet Christopher Carlton. Okay, so looking at the time, 11.22, or uh, 3.22, that's UK time, I'll, um, I'll, I'll jump forward slightly. So one of the things that became of real interest to me during the same time was the way in which, I suppose, continuing along, along the lines of the non-neutrality of science and trying to think of the obverse of scientific positivism and trying to think within what's grasped or captured by a so-called scientific method, what other properties or tendencies or densities one might find, I started to think a lot about the phenomenon of mimicry. Mimicry, of course, is something that human beings do and something that you might say we were doing in that example from the sealed library at MOCA. It's a kind of uh, staging or a kind of an imitation of something that it's not. In this case, we made an imitation of a cultural archive in a place where instead of an archive, contemporary art with all its expressivity and presence and possible speculated values could emerge. That was certainly a form of, of mimicry, but mimicry is of course a biological fact. It's um, central after Darwin's time to a theory of evolutionary biology. We might say that mimicry is a, helps to explain the way things are, the way things appear, even and especially when they appear as something that they're not. So as a way of, of thinking about the artificial nature of contemporary life, technologies of simulation and um, images that seem to be detached, not just from their referent, but even from their means of execution or capture. Now, mimicry became a way of thinking about that, not just an allegory for the artificial character of life, but an, an maybe a partial hermeneutic that came from this world that was already largely artificial. My way of going about this was um, in, in thinking about different examples called different examples in our histories of modernity that might show us uh, both sides, uh, might give us examples of the biological and the cultural phenomenon of mimicry, phenomena of mimicry, since there's two. So I'll start with um, this film that I made about the insect, the Fulgora latinaria, which is endemic to French Guyana. You can see them throughout the uh, throughout Central and South America as well. Um, but it seemed important to me that it was also um, first discovered again, like the Vinca cataranthus plant, under colonial occupation. It wasn't, of course, discovered, but it was named this by, in its neo-Greek, neo-Latin scientific name, Fulcora latinaria. So here's a, a short clip from a film that I showed first in 2014 at Full House, run by David Munzer and Becca Lieb here in Los Angeles. Moment of danger. Jeffrey, um, we're actually unable to see the same screen oh. that you might be looking at. We're still looking at the uh, okay. archive. Let, let me, Is it you? Yeah, let me fix that. Thanks, Bailey. Yeah, no problem. Perfect. Okay, great. Thanks for the heads up. Name. Two giant eyes. Back up slightly. Ocelli on wings inferior only in name. Two giant eyes 
spread out suddenly at the moment of danger. They captivate potential captors. Okay, so I'm pausing it and I'm just going to move it ahead slightly since we don't have enough time to watch the whole thing. In the eyes of a man of French letters, an alligator mask. In the eyes of Amazonian villagers, the head of a poisonous snake with wings. This is the hollow cephalic appendage, the empty head of the Fulgora latinaria. Bound in an unsealed volume, shelved in the now illustrious library of a man once committed, is a mythology of the winged serpent, but not this one. Okay, so these clips show us an insect, as I said before, the Fulgura latinaria, which is the also the title of the film. And um, this insect, as you can see, has every manner of mimetic display and, and dissimulation. It has these giant eye spots, which spread out at the onset of danger, as the narrator says. And um, these, of course, are, are false eyes. And um, they're not capable of vision um, and as eye spots, as, as you might remember from reading biology, uh, they are there simply to frighten off the predator. At its moment of vulnerability, the prey or the would-be prey engages this act of mimetic display in order to convince the predator that they are themselves bigger and a predator or at least a threat to that predator those eyes would correspond to a face that would be bigger than the whole body of this insect. And its face would then be part of a body would be much bigger potentially than a kingfisher bird that might want to eat the fulgora insect or a lizard perhaps. That's a somewhat typical type of mimetic display and a defensive uh, mechanism. As you can also see, there's camouflage that resemble the various lichens and mosses and molds that grow on tree trunks where the fulgora also likes to feed. So it has a kind of offensive mimicry, the, the eye spots, it has defensive mimicry, the camouflage, and it has this whole other thing which you might have noticed, which is this giant empty peanut-shaped mask, a, a fake head on top of its head. It's essentially a cicada that's wearing a Halloween mask that's a miniature alligator or crocodile. Um, truly maddening, and this final element of, of mimicry tips the balance and actually endangers the species because it has, it has to carry around this giant empty head. It's uh, barely capable of flight. And also it stands out. The mask is this, this, um, this empty head with gnashing teeth represented on it and really represented not, not anything but that, a kind of picture that's evolved of, of a grimace um, actually stands in the way of this potential prey, this would be prey escaping predators. So it sets up the possibility that even biological mimicry 
isn't simply about survival, that within the, the general phenomenon of mimicry, even in nature, we find, uh, we find situations in which the, should we call it, the, the mere continuance of life isn't necessarily the goal. Something else is emerging. For me, this became uh, a point of real fascination that even in so-called nature, we have this possibility of what I was referring to before of second nature. We have, we have something that's happening that simply doesn't solve and isn't explainable as a biological process. Um, and maybe it could be thought of in terms of um, a biosemiotics or um, there's a lot of different ways of thinking about it. One of the ways that I became very attached to and very interested in, which seemed to help to explain this overlap, this feeling of internal resemblance between what you can witness an example of uh, nature from, from the Fulgora and something from culture, such as an, an artist who makes films, uh, comes in the form of the thoughts of Roger Caillois. Um, Roger Caillois started writing about precisely this insect, the Fulgora latinaria, as early as the 1920s, when he saw a pinned and dried specimen in the desk drawer of André Breton, the famous theorist of surrealism and, uh, well, poet and novelist. This became a, a, a point of in, intense focus for me. Why is it that in surrealism, with everything else that becomes uh, of such interest and so so much of that being focused on the human psyche and on a critique of society and a way of reckoning the um, the various forms of mass reproducibility that are proliferating in that moment. Why uh, an interest, uh, why even a return of some sort to natural historical phenomena? Why the Natural History Museum right at this moment when the commodity form has taken over the world after the second wave of industrialization, which happened in France after the First World War. I don't have exact answers for that, but but the film and some of the works that I started to make after that came from this, uh, these questions and these interests. In the little bit of film that you just saw, the man of French letters who sees this as a crocodile mask or an alligator mask is Roger Caillois himself and um, the villagers in the Amazon uh, who see it as the head of a winged serpent, of course, are referring back to the, um, well, one of the oldest mythologies in the Americas, which they see this as a manifestation of. I'll pause there on, on this film and um, I'll move forward to a couple of other things. Okay, so I'll show my screen again. So this is a work um, here in the middle, and uh, you can see, this is a, a work that I showed at the Huntington Library the following year. No, a few years later, the, a year and a half after the Sealed Library Show at MoCA. And in this work, I wanted to push further along this set of interests and see how far I could travel along this line of fight, flight that has to do with mimicry and technologies of representation, which has to do with natural historical means of uh, representation or presentation and contemporary art or what's expected of a contemporary artist. Oh, Jeffrey, we may not be seeing the same screen again. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, let me, let me start that again. Okay. Perfect. Okay, great. Thanks, Billy. 
So yeah, um, as I was saying, I, um, this is from uh, an exhibition at an installation at the Huntington Library Gardens Museum. And um, this was from a year and a half after the show at MoCA. And here again, I'm interested, it's, an, um, it's a work by me and not this collective work. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in, in how to continue to explore these overlaps uh, between what we might call generally mimetic phenomena, such as biological mimicry and technological reproduction, and um, maybe also the space of contemporary art museums on the one hand, and the natural historical archive or the natural history museum. Um, it seemed to me then, it still seems to me now that these two elements, which often aren't grouped together, speak to one another in ways that are deeply connected and that they might be mutually revealing of one another. Not just the expectations that we bring to them, but they might tell us something about ourselves. So this is a work uh, called Mimes, and it's a slide presentation um, which made use of a uh, 70 millimeter or, or um, two and a quarter or six by six centimeter uh, slide, uh, Hasselblad projector and slides that were made from 3D renders that were uh, recorded um, directly to medium format film and uh, presented the way that they would have been in a, a high-end natural history museum or a planetarium um, in the anywhere from the end of the 1970s to the early 2000s. So it's a recently outmoded uh, technology of presentation, though some planetaria still use these uh, slide projectors because they are in fact much higher resolution than digital projectors. Um, this image uh, projected on the wall was the equivalent of 18,000 by 18,000 pixels. So an extremely high resolution render. Um, and um, the film recorded every last bit of that detail. So despite being an obsolete technology, it, it actually gives an, such an impactful image that it, it feels as though um, you're in the space the way that I guess it depends on how old one is, but the way that maybe someone once felt in a um, a natural do a nature documentary presented on, on IMAX or again a planetarium uh, with a, a very high resolution photographs of the cosmos. This was my hope was to bring some of those uh, modes of presentation back into contemporary art to see what it would feel like up against what it would what it would um, help us to think about up against the very latest in 3D rendering technology. Um, and, and this, yeah, so this presentation was there. I was very interested too in reactivating, again, trying to restore the condition of the exhibition to its um, historical specificity. The Huntington Gardens is of course a natural historical site. The gardens are a place where um, not just the public is, is invited to see nature. I mean, again, largely second nature because of the gardens being an artificial paradise, being a, a human reconstruction of, of plant zones from the tropics and from East and South Asia and Central and South America, all within Los Angeles. But also um, scientific work gets done there. There is a, a, a botanical study that, that's happening there. Um, and I'm realizing I'm I'm going on a long time. So let me take a pause here with the Huntington. I'll show Bailey if it's okay, one one last piece, and then we can break for a, a conversation. And if there's other stuff that I can show in the QA or uh when I talk to you, maybe that makes the most sense. Sure, Jeffrey. Feel free to show, you know, a few more pieces too. That I'm very interested in uh, these things being shared. So I'm here for you. Okay, we can thanks. Have a conversation as soon as you're ready. Okay, so I'm gonna show, I'm gonna move on from here to show this um, installation at the Huntington was part of Made in LA 2020, and this was a, a twin site, so a, do a double presentation. This was curated by Lauren Mackler and Miriam Bensala, and um, the Huntington Library felt to me, of course, like a, a rare and exciting opportunity to show work that was ostensibly about natural history, but also very much about technology and technologies of simulation um, in a site where it was supposedly at home. There, of course, 
butterflies abound. Not the mimetic Indian butterflies that are presented in the slide presentation, but of course, uh, monarchs and lady admirals and Mormons and all kinds of other great butterflies were, were there in the grounds of, of the exhibition. Outside, of course. And I'll just grab the film that I showed at the hammer, which was the counterpart to this piece. And um, just gonna... All right, get ready to share the screen. As caterpillars, the Euploia core, for example, completely stuff themselves with the leaves of the poisonous plant. Because their toxicity is preserved into adulthood, Euploia can be seen flying in a leisurely manner down rivers and through forested areas in India, Tibet, Northern Australia, the Indian Ocean, the Mascarene Islands, the Seychelles, the Ryukyu Islands of Southern Japan, throughout the Indonesian archipelago, the Philippines, New Guinea, the Bismarcks, the Solomons, and the islands associated with New Caledonia, the New Hebrides, Fiji, Samoa, Tonga, and as far eastwards as Nau, the Cook Islands, and the Society Islands. One more short clip. Wings alone would have had to survive as so many Lepidoptera do by whatever shock it could conjure with its wings alone. Mimicry emerges when frightful images or distasteful signs are worn on a body that in the mouth a predator would not find distasteful in the least. The Papilioclytia, which is also known as the common mime, offers an excellent example of this phenomenon because it is not in the least bit poisonous. Here the Clytia breaks with the colors and patterns of other black-bodied swallowtails with their crisp black and white stripes. Like a sudden change in direction from a couturier, the Papilioclytia displays the same dark velvet brown throughout its body wears the same spotted fringe around its head and thorax, and shows white bands and subterminal markings nearly identical to those that adorn the Euploia. However, the Papilioclytia seems to have subjected the suggestive contour of the white and cream patterns of the Euploia to a process of modern geometrization. The obsolete mimicry of a tooth becomes a cream triangle. Aposematic marks 
become white chevrons and orange trapezoids. And just one quick note before I close this part of the my conversation, the voice was uh, that of the artist Thomas Hutton, who did an absolutely virtuosic job reading out the place names on that map. And um, he's also uh, one of the artists in the Seal Library show at MoCA. So his, his work is both there inside of the shelves and, and um, he helped to build the shelves in a very, uh, yeah, very real way. Jeffrey, thank you. Such a you. thorough presentation. I can listen to you speak, watch your work and the things that prompt each process um, for quite some time. Um, obviously, you know, I kind of prefaced you with this before the before the talk, but there's there's a two part that I kind of want to jump right into to start the conversation, which is this concept of object permanence. I told you I've been sifting through, you know, um, recordings and installation views of your work, and that's something that just kept coming to mind for me, this idea of object permanence, which is typically, you know, psychological, cerebral, social space to consider. But I want to see your thoughts about object permanence as you are refiguring and constantly reconstructing, revisiting a lot of objects, but also uh, past series and works that you've uh, been developing. So can you kind of hop into that for me? And then there's a, there's a second part to that yeah. question too, but I, I want to hold off on that first. Yeah, thank you so much for that that thought. And I've been thinking about it since yesterday when, when you brought it up in our conversation, Bailey. Yeah. Um, yeah, and for giving me an opportunity to think about this. I hadn't thought about it before then, so I apologize if my thoughts are, are slightly wild. But object permanence, okay, one thing that I was thinking of in the intervening 24 hours is that oftentimes people bring up a, a lack of object permanence as a problem that someone has. So and so, meaning they're, they'll say he, he he's lacking object permanence or, or he lacks the faculty of object permanence, usually referring to someone who's very flighty, forgetful, is only focused on the present, what's happening right then and there, and then doesn't return to things. And oftentimes, you know, people in positions of power are described as this when, when they're irresponsible or incompetent in relationship to their surroundings. So, so I was thinking a little bit of the what's called the public valence of this of this word. We often hear it increasingly, I think, maybe even in a kind of um, language around political economy, so-and-so is lacking. I mean, I won't make any comments about which presidents are, are lacking object permanence, perhaps, but that'd be a subject for another conversation. Right, we're on the same page. Um, but importantly, it has to do with the... Uh, the, f the phenomenality of objects and the trace they leave in our consciousness and how that may change or somehow by some miracle may not change over the, the duration of one's life, over the lived experience that one has and um, yeah, in the course of their own lifetime. So something that's happening, we could call it at an ontogenetic level, this memory of things in their presence in our life. We could even talk along the lines of Bergson of, of the impression that objects have made on our consciousness throughout the past. And even if we're not consciously thinking of those objects, our memory is this an ever branching out cascades of these impressions from objects that have been left on consciousness. So I, I think that's such a valuable way of thinking about um, moving image work where the frames are changing and the objects are passing away from us. They're transitory in all of the poetic ways that cinema can be, the objects in a moving image work or in a film. But of course, well, my films loop. Uh, so in the presence of, of the museum or the gallery, the same objects keep coming back up and oftentimes I'm presenting obscure objects, objects whose histories have been overwritten by other ideologies or other regimes of representation. So there's an insistence that you leave with some trace in your own consciousness of these objects, whether it's a mimetic insect that comes from colonial dominated French Guyana, or whether it's a plant that 
is life-saving and we don't see as a plant anymore. It's seen as a chemical complex that's part of a medical patent. And 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 maybe in my film or, or my images, there's an insistence that you see it as an object, as a material history, and that you leave with some trace of that. Um, I also think- that's The history of photography though. Um, I, I and, and a, a perfect, yeah, a perfect yeah. example, yeah. Right, the body and coming to an image, and also how quite often without us engaging and coming to, or even we talked about this yesterday, the labor of this gesture of the recreating of the image. Um, that's also there's a very similar shift that's happening, right? It's a, great, it's a great point that you're making. I mean, even if we think of um, Fox Talbot's famous definition, infamous, depending on on your take of the yeah. pencil of nature. I mean, is this not uh, a representation of 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 of, of positioning of photography as nature's own memory. Of course, nature, memory, all these would have to go in infinite suspension as meaningful terms. We'd have to subject those to real conceptual development. But the idea, if, if there is a such thing as a pencil of nature, or there once was, we'd say in the time of, of um, chemical analog processes where light is is quite literally writing itself from an object onto the surface of a, of a light sensitive coded piece of paper, then, then object permanence is the thing that photography does. We might even say, I mean, I, I, I'm not quite confident to play amateur philologist right at the moment since I haven't looked it up, but we might say that um, the popular psychology term object permanence actually comes, uh, it's only legible to us after photography. Jeffrey, you said it. That's, that's exactly, I, thank you for engaging that with me. I mean, that's, you said it. And the second part of that, which is quite exciting for me, at least as a poet, um, is this idea. And I think that you bring it very true in a lot of your works. Uh, so I really want to see kind of where you land with this. But this idea of the sentient object. Mm, God, yeah. It is behind or involved in an object. So when we're looking at uh, the butterflies or the mimic process, um, what, what is that translation that's coming through? right, from an object. Even, even as you, you didn't really get too into the ways that you create. I, I love it. I kind of love that you referenced mostly the tools of the creation or the refiguring or reconsidering representation. Um, but can you talk about that a little bit more in depth, like how you create a lot of these um, ideas of mimicry, but also the objects that you're engaging and this weird sentience that kind of comes through. And again, this could be a very broad idea, but... Well, yeah, okay. I mean, I feel like there's this would be a, a conversation you and I, I hope we do have it for several hours. Um, okay, so, all right. Um, it's interesting that you would um, mention this potential sentience of, of these um, these pictures of mine and these moving pictures of mine, because of course they are inorganic. They're supposed to not be alive. They might represent once living or organic matter, but but here they're being presented as, as dead matter, as, as pixels or as grains is suspended in silver gelatin. So very interesting that that then you propose this idea that, that there still is a kind of sentience. And first thing I think about, of course, we when I was trying to trace back this concept of object permanence, I did think of Bergson and, and his book, Matter and Memory. Um, his cousin, Proust, of course, came up with a, 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 a redress, a, a, an imminent critique of the Bergsonian concept of, of memory, saying that it wasn't simply dead matter, but that it, it was alive and, and it had a will of its own. So involuntary memory, the, the will to speak or to reemerge of things in our memory is um, is precisely what, well, as you mentioned, the poet does, what, what the writer brings back to the concept of object permanence. So there's a number of lines, and and and, and they're all wonderful in Proust, but Proust offers us a great example of a personal cultural remembrance in which the faculty of memory is not a static, um, it's not a static entity of the human mind, but it's um, it's present in objects themselves. That somehow the past continues to dominate the present, or 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 have the possibility of returning to the present through the thing itself, through its material entity, and it can be enunciated perhaps or triggered in human object interaction. But it's always already there. And there's a number of of examples what that are really exciting to me where. 
Proust's probably aware of, of the various um, artifacts coming through um, museums of ethnography and whatnot, understood um, non-Western concepts, especially African concepts of, of animism, and they do get quoted, um, you know, somewhat flippantly, and I'm sure there's a number of ways in which they're wrong, wrong with a capital W, but, but still this idea that the thing thinks, that the thing can speak, um, does come to us. That's, one, I suppose, one, one line of flight. Um, connected to that, I suppose, yeah, I mean, in, in my work, um, all of the artifacts in the end are doing this strange thing where they're all true. I work very hard to make sure that the insect is scientifically correct, meaning that that um, biologists at universities that I worked at, are I'm in touch with them and I can send them the, the progress of the films as I work on them and get their critiques. And, and I do make changes based on whether or not something is accurate, but at the same time, it's fully constructed. It, it's it's made with the same care that I once made drawings and paintings with before I worked in this, we'll call it alienated technical format. And um, so so in that sense, the by being a willed object or an object that's belabored and, and accumulated all these gestures and all these um, elements of touch, it, there is a kind of a level of, um, yeah, psychic investment there. They're charged objects. One final way that, that the work relates, and this is more, um, well, in a way that I can, I will play amateur philologist for a moment with it. Um, the word for butterfly um, in ancient Greek is psyche. Okay. It's already a soul. Um, so, the ancient Greeks, I mean, this not just Herodotus, but Plato all the way to Heraclitus, when describing a butterfly, are saying the same word as soul. And they, it's not an accident. It's not an accidental, um, it's not an accidental pun. Um, more specifically and more strangely and more haunting for me in this, um, along this trajectory of thinking about how the how objects are capable of remembering the, pa the past and bearing witness to pastness despite the ravages of oblivion or the, the marks of pain that strike through and cancel out the environment itself. Um, in the research that I've been doing about the island of Madagascar and the historical origin of chemotherapy under colonialism, um, I've been very slowly trying to learn Malagasy, the uh, indigenous language of Madagascar, and the language for butterfly in Malagasy is lolo, which means a ghost or also soul. So everywhere that I've looked in my work, I, I haven't set out to do it, but but I can't help but see this um, this um, animation of the inanimate everywhere that I look. It doesn't hurt that I'm also quite literally animating these objects and making them move when they're, they should be dead or they should be pixels. But this word Lolo and um, from Malagasy, Malagasy to describe the, um, the butterfly is, was most recently most striking and, and gave me chills when I read it. I didn't believe it and I had to look at a couple different dictionaries to make sure it was true. So the subject, the butterfly, it reigns very true again and again. I love that you keep revisiting uh, series and wise works. It's almost like I had trouble saying your past projects or your past series and writing these things because there's it's not possible in the way that you work that there is any past that isn't engaged again and again. Um, yeah, I really appreciate you you mentioning that, Bailey. It's something that I mean, of course, recently I looked at myself. Well, I was working on something and I was reworking it for a simple thing, a screening in a different, maybe in London or something like that. And and then I thought, I found myself trying to reconstruct something that was done, already shown, already already purchased, you know, not, not eligible to be reconstructed. And I, I caught myself trying to keep working on it. And then I thought, oh God, I'm, one, I'm that artist. You know, it's like, he's, you know, 40 years later, the same film, still working on a Eureka, I found. So I, I don't want to be that I don't, it's not about perfection, but about insistence upon certain overlooked phenomena, I think. Um, but another way of thinking about that is, and maybe this is why I mentioned um, the space of friendship or the, the yeah. feeling of, it's it's not just solidarity, but sometimes conspiracy um, among friends that, that you're noticing things that aren't getting noticed elsewhere and you're bearing witness together. Um, 
And, and so maybe that's been one of the ways that I've been able to keep returning to certain subjects um, and, and, you know, within a scope of, let's say, three or four overlapping subjects that maybe once would have been described as um, ideology or maybe fetishism in, in the past in a kind of more academic context with these strong relationships and friendships and intellectual community, it does seem um, that I'm enabled that, how do you even say it? Yeah, in the sense, the negative sense of enabling that my friends enable me to continue to to pursue these, oh, let's call them ill-advised art ventures that that um, simply through insistence and through keep continuing to work on them um, are allowed to to go ahead or get finished, etc. You almost got us in trouble there, Jeffrey, because you said I, there was a piece that you wanted to refigure again and again to the point where it became uh, ineligible. And yeah. Alex ran with that. That's like a whole nother conversation that we can run with because that's astutely what uh, I was kind of engaging there. But just one thing that I kind of also was dying to ask you about, it's very, it can be simple, but one of your most recent exhibitions at No Moon LA slash Fulcrum, Feelings Out of Season. This title, can you talk a little bit about the installation, but also the title of this Of exhibition? course, yeah. And I do have a, um, maybe I can pull it up, but something to do. Um, I could do a quick screen share with if that if that's okay. Sure. Um, let's see, because this will give us both the title to look at and some other text data. All right. Um, okay. So this is a poem I wrote, if you can call it that. I mean, I'm calling it. I don't mean it exactly as a provocation. Um, I, yeah, this is a little bit in the spirit of, of what my dear friend Chris Carlton wrote in that, in that a very abbreviated, seemingly scientific form for the, um, the MOCA show, where the placard itself is the poem. I wondered if I could write a poem that was um, in the form of an algorithm. And, um, well, it's a coming together of two things. It's an algorithm uh, that defines the simulation of light in a photorealistic 3D render. So it's the current era algorithm for what's called path tracing. And oh. yeah. No, please continue. And, 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 and so that's in, um, that's in um, mathematical Greek, a kind of neo-Greek um, course numbers. And um and also um, the second part of it is in ancient Greek. And the second part of it is a fragment from Sophocles that is also represented in, in the photographic pictures in the exhibition. And this fragment from Sophocles, well, it's, a, it's under debate by non-amateur philologists, sure. especially in ancient Greek. And it says, um, it's we know that it's Hermes who's wearing the cap of invisibility. So he's in the presence of a, in the midst of a mimetic effect. And Sophocles was the inventor, according to Aristotle, of visual effects or of special effects, as he says in the words. And um, so Hermes uh, says, my teeth chatter with a great fear. And he's making fun of the, of the town elders who are chasing after him for, I won't blow the plot, but for having done a very bad thing. <laughs> And so he's doing this and there's a great, there's debate over. So I have four alternate translations from this tiny fragment of, of Greek. And it's it's not just that these people debate what ancient Greek would mean, but the very orthography of the thing, the, the what letters are full letters, whether or not it's a whole word, et cetera, have opened up all of this, even holes in the middle of it, have opened up all of this debate. So you have, in some sense, uh, an, um, a matter of scientific understanding or, or fixity. This is how we transit light. This is the algorithm that's used that I used to to make my pictures. That they are all the pictures in the exhibitions that you've seen come from um, a path tracing algorithm, and and also um, underneath that is something called the Monte Carlo equation. So light is being simulated in that way by means of a kind of controlled brute force. Um, and you can't really change. I couldn't take a, one of the other Greek letters from the second half of the sentence and plug it into the to the leftmost part of of the algorithm and still be able to render light. So that's very fixed. Um, yet 
we can see from the the play uh, that the meanings are not very fixed. So Feelings Out of Season is the name of the poem and then became the name of, of the show. Um, it's called that uh, because it's a, it's a metaphor that Aristotle uses to describe tragedy. In the poetics, um, while dealing with Sophocles, um, Aristotle says that when I go into the theater feeling sad, it could be that I come out feeling happy, meaning non-naturally, non-organically, this synthetic environment, these visual effects produce an emotional reality for me. Um, I like this for a lot of reasons. One of the reasons I like it is because it describes, one way of describing it would be that it, it gives us a way of thinking about the material consequences of a simulation, a, a false image, a constructed image can have a very, very real consequences in our lived experience and in our lives. Now that I'm thinking about object permanence too, I'm thinking of all the false images that have created an object permanence for me. Absolutely. Oh, so thank you for going into that with me. I, I okay. knew that, that was just, uh, it, was really, it was really important to engage that aspect. That's one of my, uh, not that I have been uh, following you for too long, but you know, that's one of my favorite installations that you've had so far. So I was really grateful yeah. you know, for connecting us after that uh, installation. Yeah, me too. And thanks for coming to that. Yeah. Um, so Jeffrey, this was such a good conversation with you. We're, thank you everyone for sticking with us for a little longer today. Um, and Jeffrey, again, I appreciate you so much for being with us today and for presenting your work and engaging it with us so thoughtfully and considerably. Um, well, I, I could the continue the conversation off, <laughs> off screen, so I'm sure we will. Thank um, you. I hope we do. But yeah, everyone, thank you for being here with us today. Um, we have a comment in the chat. Thank you both. It was illuminating. Thank you, Roman, for that comment. Um, and again, Jeffrey, do you have any final words for current exhibitions that you have up now, new projects? I have a, an exhibition in, um, well, I'm part of a group exhibition I'm very excited about at uh, Ehrlich Steinberg Gallery in Hollywood, run by my friends Tabitha and Ace. And um, uh, yeah, I think the world of them, I think the show is great. I'm extremely proud to be in an exhibition with the artists who are in it check it out. There's a link in the chat. And I just once again, thank you, Bailey. And thanks for this opportunity. To, thanks to everyone who came and um, I'll see you in person soon. Yes. All right, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this Saturday afternoon. Have a good rest of your Saturday. Jeffrey, looking forward to being in touch. Thank you again. You too. Thank you, Bailey. Right. Bye, everyone. <laughs>